Hey, fossil hunters, it's Don, and guess what? I'm with the Fossil Hunters, and we're back in Gainesville, Florida, at the Florida Museum of Natural History with Rachel Narducci. And Rachel is brand new to the position that she's in because the last time we were up here, we were interviewing Dr. Holbert. So, Rachel, can can you uh, introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about you? Yep. So, hi everyone. I'm Rachel Narducci, um, and I am the new collections manager of vertebrate paleontology, taking over for Richard. Okay, here we are at what's called the range, right? Yep. And what is this building actually called? So this building is called Dickinson Hall, and it's the research and collections building for the Florida Museum. Research and collections, so yep. hence the the shelves full of collections. Yes. And the range, any idea where that word came from? Oh. Dr. Okay. Holbert couldn't answer it. Dr. Webb oh, couldn't answer it. Really? <laughs> and they're like, why do we call it the range? I don't know. So the collection is set up from our oldest fossils kind of over in that direction. And then we move younger through time and this is all of our oversized storage. So we have, you know, this row all the way over there and then behind you there are many other rows. And we have an offsite building with even more oversized. Um, this is one of my favorite things in here. So it's a glyptodon. This one's actually from Bolivia, but this is the tail ring from it. So they, they kind of overlap each other and the vertebrae actually like sit in here. And it's, it's remarkably lightweight, like you can feel, oh, yeah. it's, it's just surprising because you wouldn't expect right? it to be You'd expect it to be heavier being fossilized. Yeah. They're just, it's, it's really porous. So like if you were to do a CT scan of these osteoderms, they're just full of little tiny holes. So that like really helps lighten it up. Because it was a giant shell yep. and you know, <laughs> that would have been a lot heavier. This is a gomphothere. And you know, we have even more coming all the way through. Um, some of our rhinos. So this is kind of like the one that we saw in the prep lab earlier. Um, more tusk materials. This is actually some stuff from Nebraska, so this is a bronothere, mostly ribs. Um, and then, so this is the humerus of a giant ground sloth. So this is a Remetherium eomigrans. Um, and seriously, like starting there, and then all of this is the skeleton of a giant ground sloth. And what was it that actually inspired you at a younger age to get involved um, with um, armadillos and ground sloths as being your favorite species? So I would say that it didn't even really start at a younger age. Um, it was more when I started working here at the museum mm -hmm. is when this site was being worked on, so this Hale 7G site, and they needed people to prepare the fossils from the big plaster jackets. And as I was working on a skull of the giant armadillo, I found the head shield like on place on the skull. And that, that's really what got me started because hmm. that was the first time that had ever been seen. Wow, so. wow, and you found it. Yeah, well, I mean, somebody else found it, but well, then I prepared it. I mean, you prepared it. You <laughs> yeah. pulled it out of the matrix mm -hmm. so that they could see it. Yep. That's awesome. So I know we're all interested to know, and our viewers as well, um, what kind of, what was the path that led you to this career? Right. So. Um, I grew up in Interlochen, Florida, so that's in Putnam County, mm -hmm. um, and that's really only like a 35-minute drive away from here in Gainesville. So honestly, I saw the movie Jurassic Park, <laughs> I saw the first okay. one, oh. um, and that really, you know, that was amazing, and I got super into it. And then actually, even in pre-K, I didn't know how to spell anything except for the word paleontologist. And I actually like Aww. wrote a pact, my teacher helped, but I wrote a pact with my best friend at the time that at the old age of 17, we were gonna meet back up again and become paleontologists together. Aww. And we drew a picture of ourselves riding on the back of a sauropod dinosaur. So I keep trying to find it. I know it's at my mom's house somewhere. I didn't really think that I could be a paleontologist. So I did my undergrad here at the University of Florida um, in anthropology. It wasn't until my academic advisor from undergrad in anthropology said, like, 
is there anything else you're interested in? And I mentioned paleontology just kind of like on the side. And he told me that I should come volunteer here in this prep lab. Mm. So I started on the Thomas Farm site preparing um, like a fossil dog. And it just, oh, wow. I didn't know that you were even allowed to do that. So it really blew my mind. And then that was in 2013 and I have never left. So I started volunteering and then I slowly like got hired into positions. And then I pretty much just like kept moving up until I'm in this position. Gotcha. Message to all little girls, <laughs> you can do this. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about one of my favorite animals, okay. which is the... Tortoise. Tortoise. <laughs> I have two um, sulcatas at home, and I love oh. them. That's amazing. My tortoise are African sperthi, or commonly known as sulcata. This is Herman, and this is Ivy. Herman really loves apples. That's his favorite. I'm getting Ivy out of her bowl because I'm going to give her a treat, and she keeps climbing in the bowl. And so it's fun to look at their shells. Mm -hmm. You know, they're about mm, yay big right now. Okay. Uh, but then compared to the fossils that we find and looking at the scoots and things, and so it's right. really cool. Can you tell us about these particular ones? Yeah, so this is, it's a little bit broken, but you have the carapace, so like the upper part of the shell, and this would flip around and actually connect up there. And then that's the under part, the plastron of the shell. So that's the same one? Yep, same that's animal. the same individual. Okay. And this one's about a million years old. It was collected from the Tampa area. It probably would have been like a little bit bigger than a Galapagos tortoise. So wow. just this really big tortoise that you still here in Florida. So my personal favorite is the titanothere. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a personal favorite that you like to work on and study? Yes, so I also like the megafauna, like the larger taxa. Um, so my favorite are the giant ground sloths and the giant armadillos. Um, so Holmazina, the giant pamphetheer, is like actually my favorite, but I really love all the Xenarthrins. My PhD work has actually been on that group, studying their brains. So the brains awesome. don't actually preserve, but you can x-ray, CT scan, three-dimensionally preserved skulls. That's amazing. And then actually like color in that empty airspace within the skull and sort of like virtually extract the brain. And the brain in mammals pushes up against the inside of the skull so much that it actually leaves impressions. So you can see the sulci and all the veins and arteries and everything coming off and understand like their sense of smell or even like locomotion. You can look at the inner ears for that. So, oh my gosh, that is and I, amazing. And I want to expand that to like all different kinds of animals, That's not so just cool. the xenarthrins. But okay, that That's is awesome. amazing. So how many, how many brain scans you said you've done already? Well, so I've done every single um, fossil that we have here uh -huh. in the collection, but then I've also scanned all of the moderns and arthrins wow. that are upstairs in our mammalogy collection. Yeah. So um, that's wild. It's over a hundred, but wow. it's probably it's close to a hundred. That's so. crazy. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, Rachel, I looking at the different tusks and stuff. This one has marks going down the tusk instead of across, like most yes. of them do. Does mm -hmm. this is this anything in particular? Yes, so we are quite certain that these are actually tool marks made by some kind of early human. So a researcher came to visit several years back and I was actually able to make the silicone peel for them so that they could take it back to their lab and study okay. to try to assess what tool marks were made. It's pretty much like this is where the flesh would have started on the elephant, so the early human must have been actually trying to cut away okay. the flesh from the specimen right there. Right. And that came from Florida as well? Yep, that's from Florida. Um, I think it's the Osceola River. Okay. Okay, so I guess it's time to address the elephant, or I should say the elephants in the room. Yes. I'm seeing some jaws. What is this uh, that you're working on right here? So we have a dig site that we're currently working on. We've been working on it since 2015. Um, it's, it's sort of in between Morriston and Williston, Florida. It's called the Montbrook Fossil Site. Okay. It's five and a half million years old. Oh, wow. And our most common mammal are gomphotheres. So right. that's pretty much like all of these. They're all related to elephants, right? Yes. Okay. So 
They have four tusks total, so like two coming out of the top and two coming out of the bottom. How many have you pulled from the site so far? Uh, we have at least 30 individuals. Oh, wow. It honestly That's might crazy. be more at this point. So wow. just this past season, we got a completely articulated adult skeleton. Wow. A really big one. What was the environment like that you would have so many in one spot? Was it like a sinkhole or a water it was or a pond? Or? a river. A river. So okay. we also find, I mean, tons of fish, turtles, alligators. Mm -hmm. We have a new species of alligator that we're working oh, to describe. Oh, wow. Um, That's huge. Yeah. And yeah. we haven't actually found the boundaries of it, so, oh, so it just keeps going. Do they think that that's where the animals all kind of got washed up when they died? Is yeah. that why there's such a concentration? So yeah, it's specifically like the area that we were working on this past season, it seems like it might be kind of like an oxbow lake where okay. the river curved so much that it sort of cut off and all the animals just kind of got like pushed into this right. one slow moving part of the river. Interesting. So have you found any uh, floss there? All of, is no. that No, okay. It's too, well, potentially we could because right. the earliest sloths are from like eight million years right, ago. Right. But um, we have not. Yet. Okay, so well, I'm hoping. Speaking of Armatheriums, we've got one at the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona. Mm -hmm. It was discovered in the 70s, and if you're ever in that neck of the woods, please come by and see it. It's one of the best representations I think that they've found. I would love to see that it. That would be terrific. <laughs> so we have even more Gomphotheres. So mm -hmm. this is actually the jaw of an Amabilodon, so that's like the shovel tusker. Okay. Um, I can see the shovel end of it down there. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit uh, more about this, uh, this skull here? Platybelodon is one of the signature pieces. That's why it's under the title of the show. Elephants evolved out of Africa uh, millions and tens and tens of millions of years ago. And so this is a very primitive type of elephant that probably would have been more on the mastodon level. And it has uh, these shovel tusks down here, which are very unusual. Now scientists originally thought that it was dwelling in the water and scooping up plants out of the water, but we really kind of new evidence now, because science is always changing. Uh, we realized that it probably was using the strip bark off of trees. So uh, Florida, is this a- uh, uh, there, I think there's a species of this type of animal that also lived in Florida as well, a shovel tusker. So definitely, even though it looks menacing to the average person, this is uh, a pure herbivore. So it's a lot more, you know, like elephant relative kind of stuff. We also have a very large camel that used to oh, live really? in Florida. Um, so wow. this is a femur. Now I what just, bone would this be? That's a femur? Yep. How tall would the have camel have stood? Probably like, twice the size of a modern day camel? Probably, yeah. Wow. Really, really large. A cervical vertebra, so they have like those really elongated wow. neck bones. So when somebody wants to come and study, um, what's the process? Like, do you have a database on the computer where they can go in and see what you guys have and then yes. request to come? Or mm -hmm. how does that work? So we do have an online database that um, it's, it's through the Florida Museum website and you can look up specific ages or species or whatever it is that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would email me to request, like I'm interested in looking at this group or whatever, when can I come? Um, and then we have some tables set up in here. We have a visiting researcher office. And whether you want to do research or even just like use a part of the collection in order to identify something that you found, oh, like okay. that's possible too. Okay. So it's, we want the collection to be open for use, you know? Okay. So now we're in your office and you've told us that you love sloth and giant armadillo, yeah. so you have some good examples yeah. here for us. So I have taken all of these out of the collection because I'm currently working on them. Um, so this is the nicest sloth skull that we have in the collection. Um, so this is a megalonyx. Uh, it's from the Withlacoochee River. So it's a nice three-dimensional skull. Like, I can get a perfect brain out of this. Oh. Uh, so that's my favorite sloth skull. And then we also have some of the giant armadillos. So the smaller species, this one is Floridanus. It's Holmazina Floridanus. And then we have Holmazina septentrionalis. Oh, so wow. uh, that's a difference. It like doubles in size. Yeah. And you're gonna probably find the teeth when you're out collecting. So they're these weird peg-like teeth. 
And the, this one is way more common than this one. And you were saying something about the teeth earlier, that they grew a certain yeah. way. Yeah, so they, all of these teeth are ever growing just like a rodent tooth, like how they have to gnaw their teeth down. So they're grinding their teeth down by eating grasses. So they're actually like grazing grasses, their teeth are being ground down, but that means that it's open rooted. So uh, if you just find a single tooth lying around, then it's probably all chipped at the end because there's no root oh, holding it okay. in. That's crazy. You were showing me some stuff around your office and you came to this box. Yes. So these are megalodon coprolites. Very rare. Yep. <laughs> um, and you actually know that it's megalodon because great white sharks have this like spiraling poop today. So like hmm. you find something like this in the fossil record, you kind of just have to assume that it came from megalodon. Fossil hunters, we're here again with Rachel. And guess what? We're not at the range. Even though we've got all of these big shelves behind us, this place isn't called the range. Nope. Where are we? We are at the Northwest Collections Building. So this is our new 4,000 square foot warehouse building that um, we mostly have Montbrook fossils, so that new dig site, but we also have a lot of other oversized fossils on the shelves behind us. I did notice that on a couple of the shelves toward the back, mm -hmm. I see the Wakaiva stuff from the 90s that yeah. I was able to bring up. And um, some of the tusks are there, which is pretty yeah. impressive. So maybe we'll get a chance to see those in a minute. Yeah, we should go check them out. Awesome. So on the shelves, I do notice that here's the Wakaiva stuff. It's, it's labeled Wakaiva up here. And um, I'm pretty sure that this tusk is the one that Russ McCarty put back together and it became the display tusk for your exhibits called Tusks mm -hmm. that was out there. Uh, this is obviously the real tusk and then of course we had uh, a fiberglass version of this thing uh, made for the exhibit that people could come up and touch and see what a tusk felt like. 
but it was a good example of a tusk because you could see underneath and then you could still see the bark on the outside and it had this really cool patina on it mm -hmm. and it was just a really neat coming out all the way to the tip. You could see the tip and all the wear on the tip. Yeah, that is exceptionally complete. That is very cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then this was the second one. We brought them both up to you. There's the second. Yeah, I think that's the second piece and this must be the first piece. We're here today on the 14th of August without the state and we're uh, continuing to excavate the same animal that we began to excavate just as we were finishing up our two-day expedition with them. Uh, we believe it's a mastodon at this point and it's just in the weeds to my left and uh, discovered the tusk this morning, dug into uh, the bank this side of the rest of the material that we've been able to find, just downstream of the rest of the material, excavate the rest of the tusk. We may not be able to bring it up, but at least we can completely uncover it and see where it sits and then call the state back and tell them, you know, we have one or maybe two, if we're lucky, two tusks. And then of course, all this other material, um, this one drew a memory because uh, I was able to find the original picture of me carrying it up to the boat. Uh, and this is a scapula. Yep. Right. From Probosidian. I don't know yeah. if it's, and we're going to assume it's a uh, mastodon Man. Yeah. because of the tusk that mm -hmm. was nearby. And then suddenly we're up here and we're into sloth stuff. Yep. And that's your favorite thing, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? One of them. And this uh, pelvis, correct? Yep. From a sloth was one of the very first things that came out of that river. So. And we know that it's sloth because they have a sin sacrum, so their pelvis is actually fused together. Um, only Xenarthrin, so the anteaters, armadillos, and sloths have that feature, and birds. There might be like one rodent that has it, but that's what wow. separates them. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we had to get on the floor for this one. Mm -hmm. This is very special. And I see that there are two different animals here. Can you tell me about yeah. What happened? So this is an extremely rare find. Um, it's the, so we have the lower jaw of a gomphothere, but then inside of it is this pond slider turtle. So this one's called Trachemes inflata. And we'd found it just like this. So these animals must have died within days to weeks apart from each other because oh, wow. there's like no sediment in between the turtle and the jaw of the gomphothere. So they were friends and they died together. Yep. <laughs> So we know that gompotheres were not carnivorous, so it wasn't eating this turtle. So mm -hmm. what do you think might have happened here? So it's, it's most likely that the turtle would have died first. And as the river is meandering around, you have the curve in the river where it actually gets slower, the current. And the turtle probably got pushed up into that area. And then the skull of the elephant kind of would have landed on top of it. Mm. So then maybe the jaws get stuck behind, maybe the current pushes the skull down the river a bit further. Very cool, very rare, very cool. Yes. So this is from our Montberg fossil site and it is very weird preservation because it's really just this like soft kind of loose sand, but it's, it is interbedded with clay. So that's what kind of keeps it together. Uh -huh. But that's, you know, um, what kind of tells us that this is like a river system. Oh, and, okay, so yeah. you're looking at the geology of the area and mm -hmm. figuring out it's a river system. So Hawthorne clay mixed with sands. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then what is the fossil that's actually in here? Do you know it? So this is the entire arm. So we have the humerus, the radius and ulna, and even some of the wrist bones of one of these gomphotheres. So this is a really large individual. And this one would have stood about nine feet tall at the shoulder. Wow, so this is the entire leg. It's the entire thing, <laughs> yep.
around today, we've seen so many new great things and lots of different fossils that we've never seen before and some old ones <laughs> Thanks so that lot. we've seen. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming up here to, and taking the time to visit also. Absolutely. We can't wait to come back. Yeah, sure. And as we always say in Fossil Hunters, Fossil Hunters! We're at the W.M. Browning Cretaceous Fossil Park in is this Mississippi, April? Mississippi. April's behind the camera. And um, we were literally driving home from Arkansas to see our uh, son and his wife and the grandkids. And guess what? She's like, hey, I wonder if there's just some place we could stop by a creek. She looks 15 minutes off the road. Here we are at the W.M. Browning Cretaceous Fossil Park in 1990. Cretaceous fossils, including shark's teeth and other kinds of fossils, were found in this creek. They're also in these weathered boulders that you can see around, these rounded boulders, all the way down the creek. And uh, you get a sifter, just like you would the piece, and, you know, you just start digging and looking around. Now, we're not getting in the water because it's like 40 degrees outside right now, and we're not dressed for it. But what a cool place, right off the beaten path, literally right off a highway. You can find it. W.M. Browning, Cretaceous Fossil Park. Fossil on! <laughs>